recording started. Cool. So let's get started. Um, do you guys have a chance to review somehow from the from the video? I got through the first bit of it, but cool. I haven't done the whole lot of it. Great. So today's today's class is about three things mainly. We're gonna review a few a few assignments, actually one assignment of the basic inheritance, right? And then we're gonna quickly talk about multiple inheritance and then we will just try to introduce the project as it is. Um, so it's just the two of you guys today. So we, I, know I wanna make it as quick as possible so all your feedback is gonna be much appreciated. Yeah. But I wanna make it quick because the sooner we finish with these, the, the quicker we will start working with the project, which is again the, the important part of, of this class. So, um, what we should be, you guys see the um, the part of the assignment on the Learn platform? Do you guys have any questions before, like, I jump to anything? Say, say again. Sorry, what? A, oh no, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do two things at once. I was trying to kind of start forking the project and stuff because I hadn't done that part. Um, we, I will show you that how that works in a second. Yeah. Um, okay. By the way, of course you can go ahead and do it. But um, do you guys have any questions about like from previous class or previous class assignments? Um, yeah. When I was going through the uh, assignment, just let me find it because this was a couple of days ago now, and it just wasn't apparent to me from oh, yeah. the links that. Okay, so let me go to. Ha 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 ha! I am sorry. Well, I need to go back to the homework bit. Okay, so let's go to here. Agnieszka, can you hear me correctly? Oh, cool. No problem. Just wanted to know. So also use the chat if you have any question. Um, again, my idea is to make it as private as possible. Just go with the things you guys need to know and just get started with the project as soon as possible. Right, sorry, so it was, uh, it was probably a really, really, uh, so I'm trying to find where it was. Really struggling to find where this is. Sorry, I'm sort of having to flip back and forth. I'll tell you what, carry on and I'll come back to it. it, it, it. Was it an assignment or was it something you read? It was on it was on it was on that uh, it was on the um, going through the um, on the learn platform. It was the exercise on there. There was something in there that wasn't apparent from the um, from the links that it was sending, so it sent us off to Byte Python, and said, then sent us off to Think Python, and there was something in there that I was really, really, I, 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 mm. I couldn't find an immediate answer for it. But you know, we're wasting time on this, so just let's, I, I, I'll find it in the meantime quietly, and I'll, I'll ask about it separately. That's, that's fine. Okay, cool. So I will still get started with these, so maybe it refreshes something. Um, on yesterday, we started, we, we did one of the assignments and it was the calculator with inheritance one. I am not redoing it right now because you guys can just check it out in the recording. So you have yeah. now like two different explanations. Um, shape of er, um, shape areas, right? So we will be calculating a few, and I'm just like walking this assignment. So Hopefully, I mean, we will raise a few questions or everything can just work fine and that's it. The idea of this one was to first, like, get us, get us started with not just inheritance, but also understanding design of, of object-oriented programming. 
and how, for example, these classes will be building circle, rectangle, and a square. These classes all extend from a shape, right? And you can get an area from a shape, any shape, circle, rectangle, square, triangle, if we make it work, you can get um, an area for, for those shapes. So what we're seeing he here is that this shape class has a really clear and, and, and how to put it, a, a real de declarative interface. It's like we're saying every shape will have an area and as you're extending other classes from shape, what you're doing is you need to implement the area method because if someone evokes it, that person will receive a non-implemented error, right? So if I create a circle, and how is this circle created? It's just with a radius. Uh, so if I do these and I try to print this area, oh, I submitted a solution. I want to run, but. Uh, of course, I need to, so I will try to clear these things out as quickly as possible, but here I need the init method and I have a radius, right? So I will do radius, I will do self.radius equals radius. There you go. And now if I run this code, there you go, I have the non-implemented error. So. What it's saying here is like the shape is proposing a contract and every children class, child class, sorry, will have to follow that or, or agree to that contract. And in this case, they will have to implement the area method. That's the contract that the shape class is extending. Usually these classes, the super classes, will also have some functionality. So by extending that super class, you will kind of you will have the benefit of accessing those goodies, that those things already implemented here, but uh, uh, that, that power right comes to a cost, you will have to sometimes implement something from the parent, right? So that's how this thing works. Um, now, the, the, um, the circle, sorry, something important also about the, the, these shapes is that all of them will be kind of created in different ways. So that's something completely different. How shapes are created, that's gonna be different. So that's why we see we have to completely re-implement the init method. So of course now if I wanna do the area, I need to re-implement the method, right? Well, here, and I need to do return um, 3.14 uh, times self dot radius square, right? I think that was the, the formula. So if I run it, I, I get 3.14.0. So that's the, the objective. And if I try to run this, the, this one, there you go, it works. So then I have, for example, a rectangle that it's gonna be kind of similar to this, gonna be depth, uh, where's the rectangle? Here takes a height and a width. You'll have depth um, in it, self, height. And width, self dot height equals height, self dot width equals with there you go and of course i need to implement the area which is going to be super simple self it will be return self dot time self with. so i think this is pretty much standard uh let's run the rectangle you guys stop me there's there you go um you guys tell me if you have any questions so finally what i want to get to is the square one. So a, squ our, a square is basically a rectangle in which the height and the width of its sides is the same, right? So it's pretty much the same thing. So the only thing that will be different from a square is the way we are creating it. So in this case, a rectangle is created by passing the height and the width, and the square will be created just passing the side, right? So we this is the thing we have to change. And it's going to be, let me just copy this. 
it's going to be just side. It's going to receive this side. But a, but a square, right? So we had a, a rectangle. A rectangle, there you go. So this is L1, for example. Um, and this is, um, I don't know. Or, or this is, sorry, this is, this is height. And this is W from width. And a perfect square, which I will not be able to draw, is going to also have height and width. But of course, in this case, these two are the same. H is equals to width. So what I will be doing is just borrowing that functionality from the square, from the rectangle, sorry. And I will just set the height and the width, both, both, both of them, uh, as the side. So what's the height of a square? the side what's the width of a square also the side they're the same they're the same um the, the same size if you guys want so then when i try to invoke the area from this square like here i will be invoking the area of the rectangle which already has the height and the width initialized right here so if i run these tests it should also work Make sense? Questions? All right, cool. So again, um, the idea is to start working with assignments so we can like explore. And again, hopefully you guys will have questions. This is probably too simple. Um, if you guys have questions with other assignments, just let us know, we can go with them. So the topic for today is super simple and it's multiple inheritance. We talked about inheritance in our previous class. It's pretty much what we were doing right here. So now you kind of know how it works and you have done some practice with it. What we want to do is go deeper to multiple inheritance. Multiple inheritance is going to solve the following problem. We are trying to model the universe, right? Our world, we were presented with a problem we need to solve it through an application. And by doing that, we will be, of course, modeling, right? We're trying to express the outside world in our classes. Sometimes the outside world, it's a little bit weak, right? So we will end up with things like these, right? So we have this perfect vehicle hierarchy, right? You have vehicle, ground vehicle, flying vehicle, sea vehicle, and everything seems to be tidy and they are in the particular order or place where they should be or we think they should be. But then again, we have a few examples that just don't quite fall into these categories we had previously thought. And in this case, we have a sea vehicle, right? Which is both a flying vehicle, a, this, sorry, this seaplane, seaplane, which is both, um, C vehicle because you can just take it through the water and over the water and you can also have the flying vehicle which which is because it can fly right so it has both traits and the same thing is going to happen with an airplane it can both fly and you can also drive it you know through like I don't know, whatever you want in in just the road and we end up with a hierarchy like this we have the ground vehicle the flying vehicle both of them are parents of an airplane and both flying vehicle and sea vehicles are parents of a seaplane you know so that's what we're trying to solve so now that we have the, the most difficult part about multiple inheritance is just understanding the problem and solving it with code like seeing the outside world and understanding that we need to use multiple inheritance that's the big challenge once we have understood this, it's super simple to pull it with Python. You guys just need, let me, this is going to be the base classes. Uh, so it's going to be, there you go. And we need now the, both the, the airplane and the sea plane, right? We need to create these two classes. And for that, it's going to be super simple. We're going to create the airplane example. 
we are just creating the class and listing all the parents of that class, flying vehicle and ground vehicle, in the place where we set the inheritance. So here we have only one parent, this one. And in this case, for airplane, we have both, both flying vehicle and ground vehicle. Now, the question is, what happens if we invoke this method, right? We are invoking the move method. And wait, what happened? There you go. I had the incorrect code. Um, if we invoke the move method, Airplane doesn't have a move method. So we will need it to resolve with one of these three methods. Kind of the three of them make some sense at some point because an airplane is a flying vehicle, an airplane is a ground vehicle, and an airplane is a vehicle, right? That relationship is R, we follow it with every class. So which one is gonna be implemented? I will just run it, you guys will see. It's gonna be this one right here. And the reasoning is that because remember, Python will just follow things left to right in this case. So we are instantiating A, we do then A.move. Python's gonna check what class was the one used to create this A object. It's gonna find this airplane class. So it's gonna go first to the leftmost class in these in this statement, it's gonna be this one, the airplane. So if we do have a method in the airplane, right, right here, uh, I'm if we do have a method right here, it's gonna be just used and Python will just like call it a day it's enough, I have just found the method that I needed. But if we don't have it, Python will keep moving left to right, so it's, it will get the next class, right, which is this one, and that's why we get this method executed, move. If we don't have this method, and we run it, Python go left, right, it doesn't find it right here, it's going right again, right, to ground vehicle, and it's not finding it. There you go. Make sense? Questions? So there is like a protocol to kind of resolve what methods are gonna be invoked, and that protocol has the following name, MRO, right, MRO Python. And it's a method resolution order, and it's just like a paper, you know, like a white paper, specifying how Python is going to resolve these examples whenever someone is invoking methods or attributes from a complicated hierarchy, how it's going to be resolved, as simple as that. What we usually say is that even though Python has this power, you know, that doesn't mean you guys have to stretch it and you have to create super complicated hierarchies, you know, because just because Python can handle them. Because usually these things start to get pretty complicated to read and to understand, to debug, and later, you know, if you ever need to extend something, it gets complicated. So usually it's better to keep them simple. The functionality, the power is there. You guys can do these and that's fine. You get, if you check the MRO, it's really advanced and powerful, but that doesn't mean we have to use it every time. Try to keep the, your hierarchies simple enough and flat. Questions? No? Um, you guys are fine. For the ones that have just arrived, sorry. Um, we are, so we just started the class introducing a simple assignment, right, to, to review basic inheritance. From there, we're picking this multiple inheritance one. And now what I want to focus on is on the project that we have for today, which is 
the most important part of this class, trust me, like being able to work on this brush. So this is the brush you guys will have. And the, the project that you guys will always work with, or, or sorry, the projects you guys will have to work with are always created on GitHub. And you will basically have to start working with Git and GitHub throughout like these, this course experience. So we're gonna take these super slow and gonna explain you how everything works. We're gonna first explain the project, like what you're supposed to be building. And then we're gonna see the procedure to build those, um, to, to actually build the code, like write the code, sorry. And we will see later how to submit the solution. So stop me at any moment. We have plenty of time. I will try to go as like as um, slowly as possible. So we can, like everything's gonna be recorded too in case you wanna double check it later. Any questions before I get started? So our first project is about building a car dealership. All right, so it's just a dealership that can handle both, uh, sorry, cars, trucks, and motorcycles, right? This dealership will buy and purchase vehicles. So it will sell vehicles to customers, and it will also buy, um, buy vehicles from customers, right, to provision itself. Um, we're gonna have three main classes we're going to have the concept of a vehicle the car the truck the motorcycle we're going to have the concept of a customer that a customer can actually be either a customer or an employee right and what that means is that we will differentiate we'll have this person class and then we will have these children customer and employee because we will be selling and buying cars from to and from both customers and employee. We can very much sell a car to an employee and the employee, of course, will have a discount. That's the idea. So car, trucks, and motorcycles, they are vehicles and they all are created in the same way. They all have the same attributes, maker, model, year, base price, and miles. Base price is important because we will use it in a second. So once you guys understand like the vehicles and how that works, you will be able to calculate the sale price and the purchase price of one of these vehicles. So for example, you have a car, a car will have a sale price and a purchase price. The sale price is usually of course gonna be higher than the purchase price. The sale price is the one that's gonna be applied to the consumer one when our customer, sorry, wants to buy a car from us. The purchase price is the one we will pay to our customer to buy their car from them all right so the sale price of a vehicle is going to be calculated this is a method by the way and it's super simple to calculate it's just the base price we use for the vehicle time s and s is going to be a multiplier that changes from the type uh, based on the type of vehicle so for example a car has a 1.2 multiplier that means that if i have a car with a base price hundred dollars the sale price will be that hundred dollars times s which is 1.2 so the final sale price will be 120 dollars right the purchase price is going to be computed somehow similarly and it's going to be the price of the dealership the the price of the the of the sorry the sale price to put it simple the vehicle sale price so you need sale price before you are able to compute purchase price the sale price minus a penalizer value given by the number of of miles right so we will have sale price minus this P multiplier, which is similar to S, it's assigned by type of vehicle, time, times the number of miles that this car has. So if the car has too, like, too many miles, we will reduce the price further, right? So that's how this thing works. Um, so same example, you have a motorcycle, $100 worth, the motorcycle multiplier is 1.1, so sale price is $110. If we wanna purchase the multiplier from the, the motorcycle from our customer, we will apply 110, which was the sale price, minus P, 
which is um, 0 0.009 times the number of miles. Right, so that's gonna, that's how this thing is gonna work. I'm giving you conceptually the idea, but we'll of course see code in one second. Now, what we can actually do with customers is we will be either, um, we will create contracts with them, we will sell them a car, so we're gonna have a buy contract, or we will lease them a car, and that in that case, gonna be a lease contract. Every contract, regardless the type of the contract, will have two important methods. One of them is gonna be total value, and the other one is gonna be monthly value. The, the different type of contracts we have will, of course, give you different values for these methods, but still, both these type of contracts needs to have, need to have, sorry, a uh, total value and a monthly value. So let's check an example. In this case, a buying contract is the first one. And a buying contract is created by passing the following attributes. A customer, a vehicle, and the monthly payment. How many months right, it's gonna take for the customer to pay for the whole thing, right? How many installments if you guys want something like that. So here, customer vehicle, and finally, monthly payments. So how do we compute the total value? The total value of the buy contract is gonna be the sale price of the, of the vehicle that the customer wants to buy, plus an interest per the monthly payments, the number of months divided, sorry, multiplied by sale price divided by 100. This is just math, you guys will just make it simple in code, it's gonna be super simple. And finally, if the if the customer is an employee, we apply the discount. If the customer is not an employee, of course, we don't apply any discount. In this case, I, right, is a, is an, is a variable, is this constant, is the interest rate based on the car, the type of vehicle, sorry. So if it's a car, it's gonna have a 7% monthly, 3% for motorcycle, and 11% for trucks. Make sense? The monthly value of the cost of the contract is super simple. So it's just gonna be the total value what that we were able to compute to calculate before divided by the number of monthly payments. As simple as that, nothing complicated in terms of month or interest or anything, right? So it's gonna be as simple as that. Questions? Nope. All right, so let's see how to pull this. I'm skipping lists because to be honest, it's gonna be pretty much the same thing. The only thing that's gonna change is that list contracts are created differently. They accept both customer and vehicle, but instead of having monthly payments, it will have length in months. And the total value of the contract is calculated similarly. It, it's even easier and it's just, you guys can read it, I don't wanna add to my, too much noise to this explanation. All right, so how are you guys gonna, going to work with in this case? You can very much work on your own environment if you want, but we will encourage you to start working with Clown9, which is an online IDE that it will help us, it will be easier for us to see what you're currently working with and it's gonna make it easier for us also to help you. So if you ever have issues, I don't know if you guys saw my previous email, um, the one I sent yesterday. Uh, this one, well, it was actually here. So if you, you can access that workspace and you can see what we're coding. And actually, if, if someone wants to request access, I can grant you access and you will be able to make modifications, to run code, etc. So if you ever have issues, you will give us your Clown9 URL and we'll just be able to jump and help you right in place. If you're working with your own environment, it's gonna be much harder for us and actually we might not be able to help you completely because it might depend on your environment. So it's, it's much easier if you guys use Cloud9. All right, so how are you gonna 
to get this, this project started in Cloud9, it's going to be super simple. The first thing you're going to do is just fork the project. In this case, I already have it forked, so that's why I don't see it. But if you just click on fork, that's it. Of course, you need to fork because in this case, the project is created in our own organization and you will not have privileges to submit your solution later to our organization. So that's why you have to fork. Once you have you have fork, you will have the project created in your own repo in your own um, account, right? So it's going to be the repo. It's going to be a copy, but sitting in your own profile in GitHub. And now you want to start working and changing this code to make it work, of course. So the first thing you're going to do is. You will create a new workspace. It's going to be right here in Clown 9 to get started. And you will get a few things from the repo. That is important, the important part from the repo, sorry. The first thing is going to be the, the name, simple. All right, it's going to be something like this. You put. And then you will make it public, right? It's free. And two really important things. The first one is the clone URL. So when we create the workspace, we're already importing all this code. So we can start working locally. The clone URL is gonna be sitting right here. So I'll just do copy. Usually we will recommend you guys to use HTTPS. And you will paste it right here. And please make sure it's your own repo. And then you have the template to select, which is important to select Python because it already has tools installed. So I select Python. There you go. And I create the workspace. Any questions about this? Super simple. Two important things, clone URL and Python. Once it's created, I'm going to use the one from last night so you guys can see that it's how it's working. You will be dropped to something like uh, why is this thing not closing there? Okay. So something like these. Um, sorry, I want to give it like the initial state because it's going to take some time to load in this one. There you go. So you guys will be dropped with something like this and you will be able to start inspecting and checking what the code is about. So all those things that I explain you like high level the requirements of course they are all going to be represented in code so here you will have um, contract for example by contract and lease contract you have to implement these classes um, customers right customers to build uh, vehicles same thing for vehicles um, this is by the way not in the code I have just added it now how are we going to make sure that your code works? How are you going to make sure that your code works? We will be just running tests as we do it in our traditional platform in this way, right? So we'll be running tests. But those tests live inside the code, right? So you guys will have all the tests right here in tests. You will have the test for this project. In this case, I'm going to get started with customers. Right, because it's probably the easiest class. Um, I will comment out these so we kind of see it failing first. Uh, how do I do it? And I will um, hide these methods. I'm going to change the name so we don't see them. That's it. And here are the tests. The tests are usually simply enough, but simple enough. But in this case, what you guys will see differently from our, our own platform is the way they are written. So in our pre, in our own platform, in uh, right here, I want to show them to you guys, like compare it side by side. You have tests expressed in this way, like tiny functions that they test something, one thing in particular. 
Usually these tests will be expressed in different formats. One of them is gonna be this unit test test case way that it's just creating classes to specify our tests. And there you have instead instead of functions, you have met functions, you have methods, right, inside the class. It's gonna be pretty much the same thing. The the good news about these is that the tests will be much powerful as we have, for example, assert equal. You guys will see, I don't know, assert true, assert false. So we don't need to do something like assert something is true. We can just do assert self dot assert true something. And it's usually much better to when you're writing and running these tests. Now, how, how are you going to run the test? What you want to do is you want to run this test and then you want to start writing the code to make it pass, right? That's of course obvious. In the platform, you were just clicking these buttons and we were running the tests for you. In this case, you will have to run them manually. To run these tests, you will need to install a library that it's called PyTest. And actually, you will have the libraries listed in this dev requirements.txt file. And here, to create, to install these libraries, we will not just do something like, I don't know, install, you know, right away. What we will be doing is creating virtual environments and working with virtual environments. Virtual environments are a way to keep all our libraries isolated. We will create a virtual environment. We will install libraries in there. And those things will be just available for that virtual environment. So if you guys are working with multiple Python projects on the same time in the same machine, you will be able to keep them all of them isolated. And it's a really important feature. Virtual environments is a standard in the industry. It's really important for you guys to understand it. Hopefully it's simple and you will just use them with, like you will practice with them and it will make a lot of sense. Uh, so how do you Diego? create, yeah, yeah. Um, they're just asking about Python versions. So you might want to um, that too. You can use both. Yeah, you can use both. And I can actually show you how to use both. Uh, Python, um, Cloud9 has Python 2 and it has Python 3, which is kind of all is 3.5, but it doesn't matter, it still works. Python and Python 3, by the way. All right, so we have to create the virtual environment. To create a virtual environment, you will use the mkvirtualm command. It's already here because you used the Python template when you created the workspace. That's why it's important to use the Python template. And here you will just give it a name, like EU uh, car project. And it will just create a virtual environment. Inside this virtual environment, I will install these libraries. To install these libraries, I will just do pip install minus r dev requirements. By the way, all these commands, I'm gonna, I, I have already shared with you a guide with all these, so you guys can access it um, in case you have questions. There you go, everything is explained, but of course we're redoing it right now. So now I will install all the libraries in there. And now I will see that I have this PyTest tool installed. There you go, this PyTest version 3.0. If I create a new terminal, Right, and I do the same thing. PyTest, PyTest minus minus version. I will have that PyTest is not installed. PyTest command not found. Again, that's because each virtual environment will be isolated. When you guys create a virtual environment, you will see it active here, and you will be able to activate and deactivate virtual environments. All right, that's important. Let's say that I'm working with a different project and I'm working with, I don't know, MKVirtualM. I'm building a website for my sister. So I will do a sister website. And I need a different tool here. I need, I know, pip install um, Django. I need Django for this website. I will use Django for the website. So these, if I do Python here and I need to import Django, this virtual environment, this sister website virtual environment does have Django installed. But if I try to do the same thing, for example, with, it, with this other one, 
I don't have it installed. Again, they are isolated. I remember virtual environments can be either active or inactive. So I will deactivate in this case a virtual environment. There, there you go. So I don't see this thing any, anymore here. And that means that this, this virtual environment is not active. And if that happens, nothing is going to work, right? So the commands will not work. In this case, if I deactivate this virtual environment and I do try to do Python, I don't have it installed. You know, I have to manually activate the virtual environment for it to have to work. And to do that, to activate it, I will do work on, and here I will pass the name of the virtual environment. Questions? Guys, any questions? All right, cool. So this was like a primer on virtual environments. I'm going to activate again, work on, is it work? on but it's all together work on um it was eu car project there you go and now i want to start running these tests remember it's pretty much the same thing that's happening here i want to do it in my environment so what i will do is just i will run the following command and you guys have it in the guide and if you don't remember it, just let us know, but it's gonna be something like Python path dot pytest and the test that I wanna run. I wanna run all the tests inside test, test customer. Customers, there you go. So my tests are running perfectly. They are failing because I have just commented out all the code, but they are running. And if I read the test, it's gonna say that in line nine of test customer, right um, here, these check fail because customer doesn't have a first name. Object has no attribute first name. So what I will do is just implement these piece of code. I will line command it. I will save it. And I will run the test again. And now it's failing in other place. So that means that all this is already working. It's failing now because C dot is employee is failing. It doesn't have that attribute. That's of course because I changed the name. I will put the names back as they were. And I will run the test again. There you go. All tests are passing. So this is good. Green is good. All tests are passing. Makes sense, questions? You will then start repeating this process with um, other tests. For example, let's go to test vehicles, which is a really large file and has many tests. So if I try to run test vehicles, I will have these awful output full of red, you know, and it doesn't make any sense. So what you usually want to do is start running test by test, start tackling them test by test. So in this case, we want to check if car creation works. If car creation doesn't work, then anything, any, sorry, then nothing is going to work. It's like the base of everything. Let me command the code out. There you go. So we see it failing. So what I want to do is again, I want to run this test. To do that, I will just use the name of the test and I will do the same command as before, but I will pass minus K I will pass the name of the test. There you go. So I just run one test, one fail, eight deselected. There are tests, there are eight tests that are not being run. And of course, this one is failing. If I implement the code for the test and I run the test again, you guys will see that it works. So one test is passing. That's good. I can start tackling them one by one. I can now run these other tests. And of course it's failing. So the command to run test is super simple. You guys will need this Python path here, which is awful. Um, but just go along with it. Just put it before the PyTest. 
you guys can use the up and down key, um, arrow keys in your in your keyboard to circle um, between different like previous commands. So every time you have to run a new test, you don't have to type everything again. You just hit the up arrow key and it's gonna be just completed for you with the last one. So you just need to change these names. Okay. Um, the guide has all the commands you guys need to run. And there are different ways of showing this output. So here, what we see is that v sale price is failing because car doesn't have a sale price at all. Um, this error, right, is pretty awful. I mean, there are, this, is, this is a lot of information, so it might be good for you guys. But you can transition, right, with, for example, minus minus TB equals short trace back. So the error is going to be a little bit shorter. And again, everything should be here. If we are missing something in the guide, just let us know. We will update it, but everything should be there. Questions? You guys are fine? All right, great. So. You should start with um, the project, and I will be here in the in the Slack channel in case you guys have questions. Right, just ping me there, and we will create a Zoom session. Right, we're gonna get started. Try to get started with the project. At least the vehicles part, and then you can like keep working for with um, with the other ones. The deadline for this project is next Wednesday. Yes, yes, next Wednesday. Um, we, I will email you with when, when it's due. And that's because we will ask you to submit the project. We will show, we're gonna show you how to submit it, by the way, in the next class, we don't wanna like completely throw all the information to you right now. We're gonna show you that later. We want you guys to build a project and then uh, how to put like review it between yourselves so you can provide feedback, etc. Yes, that's the idea. Oh, Fonso, you missed the first session. Didn't see that. So the recordings are all there. I will share them all with you and you guys can get started working with the project. And just ping me on the channel if you have questions, we will be here, get started. It's gonna be fun. This is a simple project, but uh, it's gonna get you introduced with the um, Cloud9 workspace, etc. All right? All right, good, so have a great night and Ping me if you have issues. Goodbye.